And today's guest, David Friedman, is a member of the Union of Concerned Scientists and co-author co of Cooler Smart Smarter, Practical Steps for Low Carbon Living. This book just came out on the 20th. Today's the 22nd, so I can say it's hot off the press and in the tech store. So if you'd like to purchase one after the talk, David will stay here and sign the book. So please do that. And please turn off your cell phones. And I think that's it. And I'm going to turn it over to Angie Coiro and David Friedman. I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you for coming in. Um, we are taping this for the internet, and I know a lot of other people intended to be here. I suspect they are outside in the gorgeous day. So if you want to refer anybody to the talk afterward, we're online at the tech website. Everything's going to be archived there. And as you write your questions and bring them in, I'll just fold them into the conversation that we're already having. So please feel free to ask anything you like. And if they're embarrassing questions, David has the right to turn them down. <laughs> um, I, want to, I want to commend you on something that you put in the book that I think addresses what a lot of us think about. And, uh, would you like to give a, a quick statement about the book before I dive in, or shall we dive in? Up to you. Well, sure. I'll, I'll give just maybe a couple of quick words. Yeah. Um, but I, I won't take too long so we can get into the details, because there's a lot of details in this book. Um, the core reason why we put together this book is, frankly, the Earth is warming, we're causing it, and we need to do something about it. Part of the challenge, though, is that a lot of our political leaders aren't doing enough to change things quickly enough. Here in California, it's a bit of an exception between the Air Resources Board and both uh, Governor Brown and, and before him, Governor Schwarzenegger. They have tried to make a lot of progress, whether it's on renewable power or cleaner cars or cleaner fuels. But in general, in Washington, when they are moving, they're not moving fast enough, and all too often, gridlock is stopping things. So what does that mean? Well, that means in a large part, it's up to us. It's up to all of us to learn some simple practical ways to get cooler and smarter by cutting your emissions of the heat trapping gases that are causing global warming. Our book, Cooler Smarter, gives you those simple steps. It cuts through a lot of the noise that's out there. There's a lot of advice out there. You know, for example, don't ride in an elevator to help global warming. Well, that will help your health, so you should do it. But the reality is the key things that matter when it comes to global warming are what you drive and how you drive it, how you heat and cool your home, the electricity you use in the appliances and electronics around the house, and what you eat. If you focus on those core areas, you can cut your carbon emissions 20% this year using a lot of the tips in Cooler Smarter. And hopefully you won't get as much feedback as that while you're doing it. <laughs> I mean, back off from you in case our mics are mean yeah, maybe, or something. Maybe it's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for that. And, and I, I think that you alluded to something I was going to bring up anyway, and that, and that is the, the amount of noise out there. Um, when you go into your 12th chapter, Welcome to Our Low Carbon Future, you talk about the Madison Square Garden sign. It's seven stories high, and it lets people know with this constant moving number just how bad it is. Right. <laughs> and, and you draw this picture of, it says, although the numbers are scientifically accurate, the huge carbon counters effect is a lot like that of many media accounts of global warming, at once frightening and disempowering. Dwarfed by the gargantuan sign, visitors stand idly by. They seem to epitomize the feelings of impotence so many of us have right. about global warming. And one other thing I want to contribute to that before we go, and that is an article that appeared today in the Contra Costa Times where your book showed up. And they went into this, this maze of questions we all end up asking ourselves. Biodegradable trash bags, well, it sounds great, but they're, if they're made from corn, corn is overproduced. And it's not a natural crop where it is in some cases. What about tankless water heaters? Well, you have to run the water. <laughs> and it, it gets to the point where you're standing at the grocery line and they say paper or plastic, and you stand there for five minutes right. going, uh, do I kill a tree? <laughs> you know. So with that, that feeling of being overwhelmed, what is the first and easiest start one person can make to grab a little power back? <laughs> the, the, the simplest thing that you can do right off is if you drive, the next time you buy a car, get a car with significantly higher fuel economy. When it comes to your carbon footprint, for the typical American, about 28% of your carbon emissions come from your car. So if you go from the average car today of about 20 miles per gallon to one that gets 40 miles per gallon, you could nearly cut your global warming emissions by 20% from one single purchase decision. 
there's a lot of technology out there now that can get us to that 40 miles per gallon. In fact, we like to say that, that 40 is the new 30 when it comes to fuel economy. It used to be that car companies were bragging who had more than 30 miles per gallon. Well, in the last few years, it's become 40. And you don't even need a hybrid anymore to get 40 miles per gallon. So buy, buy a more fuel efficient car. If you already own one, hey, drive smarter. Don't, don't, don't speed. Don't do jackrabbit starts. Make sure your car is tuned up and pump up your tires. Just basic common sense maintenance can save you on the order of $800 a year. And you know what? If you're worried about the confusion of all of this, think, think about it with your wallet. Buying a more fuel efficient car, doubling your fuel economy could save you over $15,000 over the life of the car. Carpooling once a week can save you a couple hundred bucks a year. So there's a lot of reasons to move forward with, with these issues, but fear shouldn't be one of them. Part of why we put this book together was to empower people, to give you the tools that you need to make some simple, practical decisions, like the more fuel-efficient car, or upgrading your refrigerator. Is it 10 years old? Is it avocado? Well, it's not green. <laughs> Get a new one. <laughs> Wait, well, you and I were talking a little bit about how this has become so politicized. And we're talking about what we can all do ourselves in our own home, and inevitably we have conversations with colleagues and with friends, and we may come up with people who don't believe in global warming. But you were, with what you were just saying, there are areas where we can meet and talk to people about that. If they don't believe in global warming, they certainly believe in saving money. If they don't believe in global warming, they certainly can vouch for the benefits of cleaner air in the, in the immediate term. So a lot of that is just finding a way to engage people so that we can not only do this ourselves, but also you know, generate some more following with that. Absolutely. As you try to get cooler and smarter in your daily lives, you can share those experiences with other people. I mean. I, I read this book, I, I, I was part of writing this book, and I read the chapter on, on your home. And I was shocked to find out how much more efficient those refrigerators are. So my wife and I went out and bought a new one, and we're saving 20 bucks a month on our electricity bill. So even if you ignore the global warming benefits, just simply the money saved in my pocketbook is well worth buying that new refrigerator. Or, you know, if you're worried about our oil imports or the amount of oil we use every day, I mean, we're spending about $2 billion a day on oil in this country. Buy a more fuel efficient vehicle and we won't have to use as much. One of the things I like that you did in the book is you broke down items so that instead of having this generalized idea that we shouldn't leave things plugged in, you break it down. There's the phenomenon of phantom power where something's drawing power even when it looks like it's off. And you break it down to the wattage use and the dollar cost of leaving, for example, your laser printer plugged in all the time versus leaving your cell phone plugged in all the time. Right, absolutely. And you know, part of the power of this book is, okay, I admit it, we're geeks, so we looked at the data. But when you look at the data, in the detail that we did, uh, we're hopefully providing a service to you so that you don't have to. And one of the things we found out was that if you leave your laser printer on all the time, then you're potentially wasting a hundred or more dollars a year on electricity. If you instead connect it to a power strip and turn it off, you can save that money. That's more money in your, in your wallet. Your cell phone charger, if it's not plugged in, don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. And maybe even make it all a lot easier, buy a few power strips. With one switch, you can turn off all those loads so you don't have to guess which one's the high one, which one's the low one. They're all off. Try to make your life a little bit easier and you can save uh, emissions and some money. Oh, we have turned off the speakers so you won't have that noise in your ear, but if you can't hear us, let us know. Tiny group, you can just say, hey, can't hear you. <laughs> so you were talking about the different areas we can save in, uh, not just in your home, not just what you drive, but in the food that yes. you eat. Where do we, we, a lot of us hear that, okay, a cow uses up so much space and right. puts out so much methane that you shouldn't eat beef. You shouldn't eat beef? Well, you know, where right. do you go with that? Yeah, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's not the approach we try to take in the book. We don't tell people to give up your car. Look, we live in a car culture. We don't tell people to simply give up meat. Hey, if you can, great. In fact, one pound of meat is equivalent to about 18 pounds of pasta when it comes to global warming emissions. But you don't have to give it up. You don't have to become a vegetarian. Try a meatless Monday, for example. Or instead of having meat as the centerpiece on your plate, turn it into a side. If the average American today who consumes about 270 pounds of meat a year, cut that in half, do that for four people, a family of four, that's equivalent to doubling the fuel economy in your car. 
So another simple solution that will cut your emissions, and guess what? It'll actually improve your health. It'll lower your risks of heart attack, of uh, concerns with cholesterol. So that there's a lot of ways to get added benefits besides the climate benefits. When we're talking about power and power plants and cars, it's easy to look at some of the messages that we hear from industry about why it's not a problem to drive such and such mm -hmm. a truck or why this energy company is a good company versus a bad company. I think there are subtler messages going on about, you know, when you talk about food, you don't often hear the entire idea of carbon footprint addressed by the industry, or are those messages there? Well, interestingly, in the food world, the big message that maybe a lot of you have been familiar with is the concept of food miles, which is how far your food travels. And there was a lot of concern and a lot of um, ink spilled over, wow, you should buy local so that you can cut your carbon emissions. Well, when you look at the data, that's actually not true. If you go to the grocery store, don't stress out about how far your food traveled. Why? Typically, only about 4% of the carbon emissions associated with food come from transporting it. Over 95% of it come from how the farm grows the food, how much fertilizer they use. So if you've got a farm that's maybe 100 or 200 or 1,000 miles away that uses some renewable power or is a little bit more efficient, they're actually likely to be providing you food with a lower carbon footprint than a farmer down the road. Now there's an important asterisk here. You still should buy from that farmer down the road because it supports local agriculture, hopefully it's organic, you can build a more sustainable community. Just don't do it for global warming. There are better things that you can do for global warming like cutting back on meat when it comes to food or don't waste as much. You know, when, when your mom or dad used to tell you, you know, eat all the food on your plate, well, maybe they should have put a little less food on our plate so we're not used to overeating, but don't waste that food because a, about a quarter of the energy use associated with food comes from throwing it out. Is the issue of organic versus inorganic relevant to carbon at all? Um, in some cases it is. For example, with clothing, it's very clear that organic cotton is better than inorganic cotton. But that said, again, if you have the opportunity, sure, buy that organic cotton shirt. But don't drive an extra five or 10 miles to get that organic cotton shirt, because the emissions from your car are probably going to outweigh the emissions that you've saved from that cotton shirt. I'm hearing a real balancing act here, and that it, because it's wheels within wheels every time you consider, OK, organic cotton, but then I have to drive to go get it. Right you have to be able to make those decisions without falling into the overwhelm of saying, I can't put all this together anymore. I right. can't keep the soul in my head. You know, so. no, and that's a good point. And that's why we try to keep coming back to, it's about the car you drive and how you drive it, how you heat, cool, and power your home, and what you eat. If you focus in those areas, you will get it right. You will be able to very easily cut your carbon emissions 20% this year. So, you know, it's interesting and important to talk about all these other details, and you can read about them in the book, but at the end of the day, if you walk away today with one thing, buy a more fuel-efficient car, buy a more fuel-efficient refrigerator, seal up leaks in your house, and cut back on the meat a little bit. Sealing up leaks in your house is something there's actually been, believe it or not, it, you know, arguments back and forth. People used to put a lot of emphasis about getting insulation into your walls. Even if it's an old house, you have to blow it in from the top, do what you can. And then you say, well, we have this night thermal photography, and now we see all the heat is going out the top. What's the truth there? Well, the truth is that the data shows that 15 to 25 percent of the heat that our houses gain in the winter or that our air conditioners have to fight in the summer comes from air leaks in our house. Now, where those leaks are, it's going to vary depending on the house. The good thing is you don't have to figure this out. You don't have to guess. Most utilities or state energy agencies will offer you a free energy audit. So they will come in your house. They'll figure out where the leaks are. They'll teach you how to plug those leaks. So maybe in your house it is more towards the top. Maybe it's your fireplace. If you have a fireplace and you don't close your flue, that's a huge source. Of, uh, of leaky air. In fact, in the typical house, the amount of air leaks is equivalent to leaving a window open all year round. But you know, don't waste your time chasing those leaks around. Bring in someone who will do it for free. And again, you can potentially save a few hundred dollars a year uh, by doing that. 
I had no idea until I read your book that there's actually an inflatable thing you can stuff in your, if you don't use your fireplace anyway, if, you, if it's all decorative for you, then there's this inflatable beast you can put up in there right. to block the loss. Right, and, and if you do use it, maybe upgrade yourself to something that's more uh, actually designed to heat your house. Most fireplaces look good, but they don't actually heat your house. On the order of 90% of the heat goes straight out of the chimney. So if you instead buy a fireplace or, or a, um, a wood-burning stove that's designed to heat your house, you'll save money because you won't be wasting money buying wood and not heating your house, and you'll actually be able to seal the system up better when it's not in use. Well, let's talk about the source of the heat. If, if you're using the fireplaces and you choose to burn wood, mm -hmm. or you choose to put in a gas-burning fireplace, is, is one of those inherently carbon savvier than the other? Gas will tend to be better than wood as long as it's in an efficient unit. If it's in a fireplace where you're losing 90% of the heat, you're better off with that wood-burning stove. But again, this is one of those things where go with what you've got, seal up your home, and you're going to be better off than really struggling over a lot of these issues. There are some sustainable sources of wood out there. You know, part of these details are also about the overachievers. And there are overachievers in, out there, and we want people to go beyond 20%. I mean, look, global warming is happening, and we're ultimately going to have to cut our emissions by as much as 80% by 2050 if we're going to avoid the worst consequences. We chose 20% not because it's going to solve the problem in one single step, but because it's tractable, it's practical, it's achievable for basically every American. If you're an overachiever, great, go to 50%, go to 80% as soon as you can. But in many ways, this book is targeted at people who just need to get started down the road to getting cooler and smarter. When you say that eventually we need to get to 80%, is that something that is predicated on all Americans doing that, all the world populations doing that? Who, who doing 80%? Great, great question. So the, the Earth is warming. It's warmed over half a degree already. And what we're trying to do by targeting 80% reduction in the United States is to avoid that from going over a two degree increase. When you get to that point, the impacts of climate change becomes worse. We have to start talking about losing the, air, the Sierra snowpack with the massive economic consequences that would have, not just to the ski industry, but the agricultural industry in California. So the United States needs to cut our carbon emissions about 80% by 2050. Uh, on average around the world, it needs to be about a 50 to 60% cut. Well, why is it higher for the US? Well, our carbon emissions are about four times the global average. We're even twice um, countries that have a similar standard of living like Japan or uh, France. So we've got a long way to go. We've got a big carbon footprint. And the silver lining there is that means we have a lot of opportunities to cut. Are there other nations where this message is catching on? Are we, are we the, the voice in the wilderness that we're trying to do the 20% each, or is it happening elsewhere? Well, in many cases, many other countries are ahead of us. I mean, certainly Europe um, has had greenhouse gas standards for cars well before us. We're finally catching up to them, and our cars will, uh, if the law gets uh, approved within the next few months, uh, our cars will be producing about half the global warming pollution they do now by 2025. But Europe's already moving ahead, Japan's already moving ahead, China in many ways is already moving ahead. So frankly, the United States is behind the curve in putting these solutions to work, but guess what? Everyone here can change that. If you commit to cutting your carbon emissions by 20%, in fact, if every American did that, that would be equivalent to shutting down one third of the coal power plants in the United States, 200 out of the 600 coal power plants in the United States with clear health benefits, with clear climate benefits, and in general, with more money in our pockets. I'm glad you brought up the use of the coal plants because one thing I got out of the book that really surprised me is how different it, how different it can be from one state to the other. If, if, if we here work on cutting back by 20% our, our carbon footprint, and it has to do not just with our cutting down our use of electricity, but how that electricity is generated. It means one thing in California, where a very small amount comes from coal, or what, third from the bottom. Right. And another thing, if you're in West Virginia, where what is the percentage there? 37% of their power comes from coal. Well, across the United States, it's about 40% of electricity comes from coal. California is a lot better, um, but even California can get cleaner. In fact, by 2020, 
about one third of California's electricity is going to be coming from renewables, thanks to a policy that, that was recently passed here called the Renewable Electricity Standard. So even California, where most of the electricity comes from natural gas, can get a lot cleaner by moving to renewable resources. But California is a model for the nation, frankly, when it comes to cleaning up uh, electricity. Uh, whether it's actually the, the, a lot of the Midwest is among the worst in the country. Uh, West Virginia exports a lot of their coal to the Midwest. And so we actually just did a study looking at electric cars, trying to understand where are electric cars the cleanest. It turns out that in the United States, in California, an electric car is equivalent to, to buying a car that gets about 80 miles per gallon. But in certain parts of the Midwest, it's equivalent to driving a car that gets only 33 miles per gallon. So that's better than the average, which is 20, but it's not a home run. So right now in Michigan, for example, they're trying to adopt the same policies California has, which is a renewable electricity standard. So part of the lesson in the book is do everything that you can to get to that 20%, and then teach others how you did it, and tell politicians Look, I'm leading by example. I'm doing this. Now you need to put the policies in place so that it's easier for everyone to cut their carbon emissions. You know, I often hear that presented as an either or. There's no point in getting electric cars right now because driving an electric cars is the equivalent of having a coal-fired plant under your hood. Um, as though we're going to wait for all the coal firing to be phased out and then we'll work on electric cars. It's, it's not an either or. You've got, you've got to work on both directions at the same time. Absolutely. We need to clean our cars and clean our electricity grid both at the same time. And what our study shows, uh, that study is called State of Charge. What that study shows is that no matter where you live in the United States, plugging in an electric vehicle on average is better than your typical gasoline powered car. So clearly electric cars can cut global warming emissions and as the grid gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, they become stars as they are in California. I, I want to get back to the idea of policy because one thing that's it's a real important takeaway on the book is I thought it was going to be like 50 simple things you can do to save the earth. It's just this list of stuff. It's much more than that. And, and you go into how people can affect policy yes. and how people can pass the messaging on. So it goes much further than that. I want to stay with the list though for the time sure. being because we haven't really talked about stuff. Okay. We haven't talked about we, we're an acquisitive consumer's culture by nature. You know, we, we still get talked to about, you know, buying something that will make us happy or make us right. fulfilled. And it's hard to cut that back. Absolutely. And what we found is the tangible stuff we buy, the stuff we keep, is responsible for about 10% of our emissions, so about one-tenth. Um, that's everything from books to clothes. Um, but it, it, it doesn't include, for example, going to the doctor's office or going out to eat. Uh, those other things, the things that you don't keep, they're about 16%, and they're hard to control. I mean, you can't control um, where the tech sets their air conditioning. You can't control what kind of lights they use here. You can control those things at home. So when it comes to the stuff you buy, it's about 10%, and that's another one of those places where we say, don't agonize. Don't sit around sweating every single purchase decision. There are some things you should try to avoid doing. You should replace this with this. <laughs> Try not to get bottled water because you end up, there's a lot of emissions associated with um, the plastic that goes into bottled water. Um, tap water is actually better regulated than bottled water, so in general you can feel quite safe filling up a bottle like this with your water. But the big lesson when it comes to stuff is kind of the classic thing we've been hearing for a long time, reduce and reuse. I've got a three-year-old son. I can't tell you how much of his clothing and toys came from friends, neighbors, garage sales. We've barely had to buy anything for him because we've just tried to reuse things that other people have. That's probably one of the best steps that you can take is buy less stuff, reuse things where you can, or think to yourself, do I really need that? And if, you know, maybe if you're only going to wear it once, maybe you can skip it. But that's not the place to spend the most of your time. You want to spend the most of your time on your car, your home, and what you eat. If you've done all that, great. Spend some more time on, on your stuff. Some of the arguments for buying new, and I, I thought of this because you're dealing with a child in your case, 
I always think of Garrison Keillor on uh, Prairie Home Companion who's always saying, brought to you by the fearmonger shop. <laughs> and one of the things brought to you by the fearmonger shop is, is the idea that there are so many germs all over everything. How could you give your child a used toy? <laughs> who knows where that thing has been? Who knows what child's mouth has been on that? And bingo, you as a responsible parent are now obligated right. to go buy a new toy. Right. <laughs> Well, there, there are things called wet wipes that can take care of a lot of that. <laughs> um, and, and there's also, you know, when it comes to clothes, what, one of the interesting things that the book does besides telling you what makes sense is it tells you some of the myths that don't make sense anymore or, or some of the old practices that don't make sense anymore. So if you get some clothes from a, a garage sale, they probably wash it. Maybe you want to wash it again just to be sure. Throw it in the laundry, but don't put it on hot. Today's detergents work really, really well in cold water and washing something in cold water uses one-fifth the energy and has one-fifth the carbon emissions as washing it in hot. It'll be perfectly clean. You're not going to give up anything there, and you won't be producing as, as many emissions. You know what I love about this? This, is, this is, book is full of cocktail party chatter. The way you're like <laughs> whipping out the one-fifth. And there's, when you were talking about the bottles, forgive me if my memory fails me, I think it was 55 million tons yes. of, uh, of carbon. Right because of the production of the bottles that those yes, things are in. Yes, it's not even the water. Now, water, as a lot of people know in California, is a carbon source uh, on the order of, I think, one-fifth of California's electricity goes to pumping water all over the place. Um, but bottles are a big deal, too. I do want to remind you, if you have any questions, just jot them down and pass them over to Leslie, and we'll, we'll go ahead and integrate them into our conversation here, because I'm sure we're provoking some thoughts. Uh, so let's do talk about when you've cleaned up your own home, so to speak and you go to move out with the message. You're very specific about how you get questions and opinions out there. For right. example, you talk about not just, oh, write a letter to the editor. You're very specific about how these are yes. done, and how to effectively get them into print. Give us some of those ideas. Sure, thanks. That, that's, that's a great question because, you know, if, if you get mad, if you get frustrated when you see a news story, or if you have something to add, you know, maybe you get our book and you read it and you have that factoid about, uh, washing in cold water is, is one-fifth hot water, and you want to get it into the newspaper, you've got to, be, you've got to write a 200-word letter to the editor if you want them to consider it. You've got to be tight. You've got to state. You've got to refer to the article. You've got to give your clear message right up front and get it done in 200 words because space is a huge premium when it comes to newspapers. So don't waste a lot of time explaining the details of the points. Get to the heart of the matter fast and get it out the same day. The quicker you get it out right after the news story comes out, the better chance you have. Someone anticipated a question I meant to ask, and I thank whoever it was. Buying online versus going to the store. Mm -hmm. You want to tackle that one? It's another one of those things where don't spend a lot of time stressing out over it. Uh, take, take a book, for example, this book right here. If you drove to the store and bought Cooler Smarter, you're going to produce more emissions from the typical car in a six mile round trip than is going to be produced in actually making that vehicle in the first place, that, sorry, making that book in the first place. So what really matters is, again, the car you drive, not where you buy stuff from. So if you want to go pick up the book and you're driving in a hybrid, then it's not going to matter as much whether it comes from online or whether, uh, whether you went out and bought it yourself. And remember, at the end of the day, there were still trucks that bought that, um, that product, whatever it is, to the store. So most of the emissions are already in the bank, whether they brought it to the store or they brought it to your house. And also, companies like FedEx and, and uh, UPS, they're trying to do a real good job at making their delivery trucks more efficient. I mean, even things that may sound crazy, but they try to create routes where they only take right hand turns so they don't spend a lot of time sitting waiting for lights. They're investing in hybrid technology. In fact, a lot of what these companies are doing are the same things that we're talking to you about doing. And that, that's one of the other lessons in the book, is all of these lessons, they apply to your own life, but they apply to where you work. So if you notice that, for example, where you work, they leave the, uh, the laser printers on all night, talk to someone. Maybe there's a sustainability person at your office, and you can give them a tip and they can implement a program of, of turning all of those off. You can multiply your impacts by 20, 200, 2 million if you get engaged at your workplace, in your community, and in your government. It's funny, I remember when I started to work for Mother Jones Magazine, I was astounded to find out they didn't recycle their coffee grounds. No <laughs> compost at Mother Jones. 
so for people who might be in that situation, they see something that can be fixed at the office. How do you, how do you bring that up without being, the, you know, the squeaky pain in the butt right. whiner? Uh, there, there's a couple of tips there. I mean, one, definitely find out if there's someone already in charge of that. You know, don't necessarily just trying to find your random boss or the random person. Often companies these days do have a sustainability coordinator. Talk to them. Ask them what they're already doing first. Don't start by accusing. Start by getting information because maybe they have something planned. Or maybe if you just start the conversation, they'll be more open to hearing about the suggestions you have to make. If that doesn't work, you know, you can do other things. Organize things a little bit more informally. Talk to a few of your coworkers. Get a few people involved. They, once they start to seek success, they can share those lessons with other people around the company. But you know, it doesn't work to pound your fist. It doesn't work to frighten people. What works is finding out what they care about and seeing if these solutions can work for them. And then once you've got them, take the chance to educate them. Take the chance to let them know that, hey, 15 of the last 16 years have been the warmest on record. Global warming is a serious problem that's caused by all the electricity we use, by the gasoline we use, by the coal we burn. So once you've got them talking about ways to save energy, then you can also have a chance to educate them about climate change and about the importance of getting cooler and smarter. I'm going to incorporate one of my questions into one from the audience. Uh, someone asked about driving versus flying, mm -hmm. and I want to piggyback on that and ask you, too, about the efforts that people make to counter their use of carbon dioxide. They pay into a bank or they do other things. Talk about both of those. Sure. First, the driving versus flying. Okay. Um, driving versus flying. W one of the interesting things that this book showed is that when it comes to personal transportation, now we're not talking about work transportation. We're talking about transportation for visiting friends, relatives, family. Um, about n over 90% of your carbon emissions come from driving your car. Less than 10% come from flying, taking the train, taking the bus, things like that. So that's part of the reason when it comes to your personal travel, we focus so much on your car. Because um, while planes can produce a lot of pollution, we just don't use them anywhere near as much as we use our cars. That said, if you are going to take a flight, there are some basic tips that you should use. Avoid first class. If you sit in first class, you're, because you're taking up so much space, you're effectively doubling or quadrupling your carbon emissions compared to um, sitting in the, in the back of the, in the, sorry, in the main cabin. Um, also, try to fly direct. So maybe you're not as comfortable because you're, you're not flying first class, but make yourself comfortable by flying direct. Each time a plane has to stop and change direction or take off, it wastes more energy. So if you can fly direct, it's worth it. Your carbon emissions will be a little bit lower. Uh, but the, one of the interesting things we found, however, is in a trip that's, say, 500 miles or more, you're actually better off flying than driving alone. Because airplanes are so generally full today, they aren't as inefficient as they used to be. So now, yes, if you're putting four people in a Prius and you're driving 100 miles or 200 miles, drive. You're much better off. You might be killing each other by the end of that. <laughs> Possibly. It depends, <laughs> depends on the family. Um, but if you're going alone, you're better off flying than driving. The, the one I, I'm not quite getting is, is the first class. I, mean, I never fly first class. Anyway, <laughs> but if I choose not to do it, first class is going to go there with or without me. Or are you talking about decreasing the market for, for first class? That, that's a great point. So. You know, a lot of our choices, there's, you know, there's the question of what is my immediate impact and what's my long-term impact. In this case, yes. I mean, if you choose to fly airlines that don't have first class, you're sending a clear market signal that that's the right way to go, and you will see less first class offered. Uh, but e even if you're, e even until that happens, know that by you making your choice, you're sending that clear signal. Okay. And then your second question. Uh, we were talking about the, the trying to compensate oh, right. for using, yeah, yes. offsets. Um, now, there's, there's two classes of things that are out there when it comes to compensating for the energy you use. One is actually not compensating, it's truly changing the energy you use. Many utilities today will allow you to buy green power. So you'll, maybe, you'll pay a, a penny or two more per kilowatt hour, but they will use that money to invest in a new um, wind farm or a new solar f facility. Uh, or maybe they'll put on rooftop solar. Uh, on some houses uh, or, or businesses around town. So you can directly help pay to finance the expansion of renewable power. That has clear 
demonstrable positive benefits. Now, on the other hand, there's something called offsets, where think of it as paying someone else to plant a tree or paying someone else to reduce their emissions. That's a good thing to do as well, but that shouldn't be your first choice. Your first choice should always be to cut your emissions. That's why we're focusing on encouraging everyone to cut your carbon emissions 20%. If you cut your carbon emissions 20%, you don't have to worry if someone's actually following through on that carbon offset. You don't have to worry if five years down the line they're not going to change their practices. You're guaranteed to be delivering those emissions reductions. Once you've made your cuts, if you still want to buy carbon offsets for what's less, great. Do it. It, it can help too if you buy it from a certified provider, but that shouldn't be your first choice. The first choice should always be to cut your own emissions. Someone had a good question about electric cars. I've heard this, this floated a lot, and that is that you're, what you're essentially doing is you're powering a battery to run the car, yes. and batteries are inherently toxic. They have pollution, they use scarce materials, they're hard to dispose of. So how does that work out? That's a great and important question. There's two issues at play here. One is, just so that it's clear to everyone, when it comes to global warming pollution, about 90% of the pollution from driving around in our, from, from our cars comes from driving around. Only about 10% of the global warming pollution from our cars comes from making them and disposing them. When you switch to a battery electric vehicle, maybe it goes up to 15 or 20%. Still, it's the energy you use that dominates your carbon footprint. As a result of that, over the life of the vehicle, electric cars are clearly going to cut down on emissions. That doesn't change the fact, though, as you said, that that battery is made from things like lithium or nickel. Now, on the positive side, however, those batteries are valuable products. At the end of a battery's life, it's actually not a complete wreck. Only parts of it maybe aren't working as well as it should. So we go back to what we said about stuff, reduce and reuse. In this case, that battery pack, maybe you pull out the, the units that weren't working, put in some new ones, and now you've got a refurbished battery pack that someone else can use for their electric car. Or maybe uh, it ends up going to help one of Google's server farms so that they have backup power or, or higher quality power so that your data is more secure. At the end of the day, though, you want to recycle it. it, it it's going to ultimately wear out, but all the materials in the battery aren't used up. So you can actually put them in a process, recycle them, and put them in new batteries. Honda, for example, has just launched a whole new facility and a whole new program for reclaiming all the batteries from their hybrids, making sure they're recycled, and using the materials either in new batteries or in other parts of their cars. So there's a strong financial incentive to make sure that once you take those materials out of the ground, you reuse them over and over and over again. Just, just like recy recycling a, an aluminum can. If you recycle your aluminum and then buy a can made from recycled aluminum, you cut the energy used to make that can by over 90%. There are similar concerns about uh, light bulbs, low energy light bulbs, mm -hmm. is that they're crammed with mercury mm -hmm. and there's no safe way to dispose of them. So you're trading the one problem for the right. other problem. Uh, we hear that one a lot and that's one of those examples of, I think, advice that may sound good on its, uh, on its surface, but the reality is, we talked earlier about how about 40% of electricity comes from coal. Well, guess what? Coal power plants produce a lot of mercury. So in general, if you switch from an incandescent light bulb to a fluorescent light bulb, which uses about one quarter of the energy, even with the small amount of mercury that is in a compact fluorescent, you're on net going to be reducing mercury emissions into the atmosphere. But hey, go even farther. Switch to an LED light, which has about one eighth the energy use of an incandescent light bulb, no mercury, and that's the same as turning uh, your lights off six out of every seven days, which wouldn't be very fun, but you can get those efficiency savings just simply by putting in one of those uh, LED lights, and you'll get great light. LED lights are, are even superior to compact fluorescents. They meet or beat um, incandescence when it comes to the quality of light. When you say quality of light, you mean color, cast? Uh, color, I mean, you'll, you'll hear some concerns, in, um, especially in the bathroom, um, putting on makeup or just getting yourself ready in the morning, that combat fluorescents don't always work great for that activity. Um, LEDs are a home run, and they use half the electricity of a compact fluorescent. So 
they're a great choice and they last a long, long time. So it's not like you have to worry about replacing them all the time. So don't stress out over mercury. Buy compact fluorescence. If you're really worried about it, get an LED. You'll save even more money, cut your emissions even more. Are there uh, conventional items in Europe, for example, lights that switch off automatically, very common in France, that we ought to be adopting here? That's a great question. And one of the simplest and most cost-effective things that you can do is to actually buy a programmable thermostat. The low-end models are, are $20. The, the mid models are on the order of $30 to $40. What those programmable thermostats do is they allow you to set up your house so that when you leave, it backs off on the air conditioning or the heat. And when you go to sleep, it backs off on the air conditioning or the heat. So you're not, you're not going to notice it. You'll feel just as comfortable as you are now because when you're home, it'll be heating or cooling it just the way you want, but it can cut your carbon emissions by about 15% just by taking the five minutes to program that thermostat. Though ironically, one of the things that our, we found in our book was that a lot of people have programmable thermostats but never actually go in and program them. It's relatively easy. It only takes five or ten minutes. There you go. Perfect example. I'm getting so to it. So <laughs> do it. I mean, you know, when you go home today, Angie, just take that five minutes, program that, at, uh, your unit, and you could save one or two hundred dollars a year on your heating bills. Which goes right to someone's question they just brought up, uh, that since it comes down to it's about the money, <laughs> how can we make this work in our favor? And that goes back to how you get the message out and right. how you talk to politicians. Right. You know, it all depends on who you're talking to. My guess is most of the people here today, um, you would be convinced just simply by the fact that cutting carbon emissions is the right thing to do because we have to do something about global warming. But not everyone's in that place. So what we try to do in the book is give as many examples as possible of the $100 you could save by um, turning off your laser printer, or the $200 you could save by sealing up air leaks, or the $18,000 you could save by doubling your fuel economy. If, if you read the book, just pull out a highlighter as you're going through and highlight a few of these numbers. And if you're talking to someone who's concerned about their bottom line, hey, tell them they can save a lot of money. Or even give them the example, for example, of um, the Empire State Building. Huge building. And what they did a few years ago is they put a lot of the lessons to work that we're suggesting in this book in terms of cutting down on leaks and upgrading appliances. They're ending up saving about $4 million a year on their heating and cooling bills. Wow. It costs money up front. I mean, it's a really big building and they did a really good job, but that investment is paying for itself in four years. After those four years, it's just money in the bank. So in fact, when you think of it, if you're worried about whether you're worried about the green of the environment or the green of your pocketbook, saving energy cuts emissions and puts more money in your pocketbook. It's, it's really straightforward and I think that's a message everyone can appreciate. One of the things that, that it's difficult to get market buy-in on is to reduce packaging, reduce shipping, et cetera. And, and because someone did ask about the European market, if you're going to produce a computer in Europe, you had better be able to account for what's happening to mitigate the carbon, what's going to happen to mitigate the packaging. And that hasn't really caught on here. No, it hasn't. I mean, in, in Europe, they, they actually know the term life cycle accounting, which means basically accounting for every bit of energy use from cradle to grave for that product. Uh, the auto industry has gotten a lot more into that because it's such a, a global industry and they're doing a better job. But the food industry, the toy industry, certainly, they don't get it. So part of that is when it comes to food, try to buy fresh food that isn't packaged. Try to avoid processed foods that come in a lot of packaging. Those are both things that will improve your health, improve your quality of life, and will have a measurable impact on cutting your carbon emissions. But again, even then, th those should be your priorities after you've focused on your car, your home, and cutting back on meat. So move forward with those, but those should be for the, the overachievers, not for the, for the average person. The phrase clean coal, <laughs> and I know that that's largely, or at least for most of its life, has been a marketing right. campaign more than, than, but is there any truth to it now? Is, are we getting toward clean coal? Um, 
there have been regulations that have forced coal power plants to install scrubbers and other equipment that has dramatically cut down on the emissions coming from coal. But calling it clean coal is, it's like having a plate of pasta and you know, maybe it used to have a bunch of cockroaches on it, but you've taken all off, all of them off but one and you're saying it's, co it's cockroach free. Look, any cockroaches are bad. Any pollution from a, a dirty coal power plant is bad. What we need to ultimately do is phase out coal as a power source. In the near term, we can replace it with natural gas. But in the long term, what really matters is making our homes and businesses more efficient so we need less and investing in renewable electricity. I mean, never forgive you for that vision. Sorry. That's, that's terrible. Well, it, it, it's, it just, it's one of those things where, as, yes, as a geek, it frustrates me because you, you see all this green marketing where they use terms clean diesel, clean coal, that sound good, but when you look at the numbers, yeah, maybe you're 80% better than you were before, but that 20% is still causing asthma. It's still causing lung disease. It's still a serious problem. So, you know, if I have to talk about cockroaches for people to get it, then I will. I needed to reduce <laughs> carbs anyway, so no problem. Uh, someone asked you to, to please explain the market for carbon credits. Can you break that down? How does that work? Sure. Um, now, this is another thing where in Europe it's, it's more developed than it is here, um, but there's a couple of different things that are happening in the United States when it comes to carbon credits. Uh, there is the Chicago Climate Exchange where you can effectively um, buy the right to emit, and if you just hold on to that, then effectively someone won't produce carbon emissions. They'll look for efficiency or renewables to substitute for that. Um, in the United States, it doesn't work all that well right now because we don't have a nationwide system where we have a price on carbon. Now that's different in California. In California, power plants are already coming under a system called cap and trade where you have to have um, an allowance that either you pay for or get for free to emit pollution. And if you emit less than that, then you can sell that allowance to someone else. The whole concept is to create a market, to create a price signal so that if people are producing too much carbon emissions, it gets much more expensive to produce it, to buy uh, one of those carbon credits in, in a tight market. So instead, they'll invest in efficiency or renewable energy. But for most people, it's not a, a common solution. But you can go out there. You can buy carbon credits. Again, though, the first step that you should take is cut your own carbon emissions. Give yourself credit for cutting carbon emissions before you buy someone else's credit. For those who are willing, to, willing and ready to move past their, their personal home front on yes. this, one of our audience members wants to know your recommendations for effective political action. Mm. You know, that, that again gets back to both how you move forward and where you move forward. One of the things we encourage everyone to do is go to our website, coolersmarter.org, and one of the things you can do there is you can join the Union of Concerned Scientists. In fact, if you do so at, at $35, we'll also send you a, a book and we will connect you to a lot of opportunities to weigh in with policymakers about what they should be doing to, give, to make it easier for you to cut your carbon emissions. For example, here in California, uh, the, the governor, Governor Brown, wants to go beyond just getting 33% renewable electricity to having um, rooftop solar available around the state so that at your home or at your business, you could actually install solar power you can feed energy into the grid so that we're not using as much natural gas. Well, as he moves forward with that policy, he's going to need to help from everyone here to weigh in, to call your representative when votes come up on these policies, call them on the day or the day before that vote happens, tell them the issue you're calling about, tell them whether you support or oppose that bill, in this case, supporting more rooftop solar, and tell them where you live. Just that simple message can mean a lot. In fact, that we often get people to you know, click on an action and send in a letter, uh, which is really important, but they appreciate even more you picking up the phone and calling them. So sign up with us. We'll show you when it makes sense to send that letter, but we'll also help you get connected at the right time uh, with your policymakers. And don't stop here in California. Folks in Washington really need to hear about the changes that we all need to get cooler and smarter. How realistic is the picture that you hear painted that if you put solar on your house, you can make your 
your usage spin backward, you can make money on it. How realistic is that? It, it's, it's pretty realistic. I mean, I know there's been some controversy over the issues, but around California more and more there's the adoption of these smart meters. And these smart meters can track very clearly how much energy you're using, when you're using it, and <clears throat> if you're feeding energy uh, back into the grid. Uh, and in fact, you can get a good rate for feeding energy back into the grid. Now, even there, we need better policies. In Europe, they have something called a feed-in tariff where they guarantee you a specific price for any renewable energy you put back into the grid. It's not quite as good as that uh, here in California, but you can often get tax credits for installing that solar, those solar cells. Utilities are required by law to give you credit for that. So it's a smart investment. If you've already gotten your 20% or even 40% and you want to put out that solar panel, great. Combine that with buying an electric car, and now you're, vir you're driving around in a car that's virtually emissions free. It's funny how a lot of the same issues that come up with the batteries in the car I hear floated about the solar mm -hmm. industry, where you're buying something that's made in China, it's shipped over here, it costs so much to ship it over here, carbon footprint of shipping it here, and then you have this massive unrecyclable toxics in the shape of a, a solar cell. Can you address that? Um, I can address it a little bit. Uh, certainly, well, there's two, two issues in terms of shipping it. Uh, to pardon the pun, but a slow boat from China actually doesn't produce a lot of emissions. So we're, we're not actually in really bad shape when uh, emissions-wise when it's being shipped over from China. But hey, I'm an American. What I'd like to see, frankly, is not because of the carbon emissions, but just so that we can build a stronger industry, we should be making more of those solar cells here so that we can be creating jobs here in the United States uh, and cutting emissions and producing more renewable energy in the process. So um, the, the life cycle emissions of a solar panel are a lot better than a coal power plant. Again, think about mercury from a coal power plant um, versus some of the issues that you might have with the end of the life of a solar panel. They just don't compare. And again, those, sol those solar panels, you have to invest in them to put them up, they're not uh, free, which means they have some economic value at the end of their life. So the degree to which you can recycle components from the solar units can give you an opportunity to re reuse and reduce the amount of materials that go into moving forward. But look, at the end of the day, global warming is the largest long-term environmental threat facing this state, this country, and the world. And so in a lot of cases, it makes a lot of sense to move forward with smart solutions that cut down on carbon emissions as one of your first environmental choices. If you're worried about wildlife, you've got to worry about global warming. It's going to impact their migration patterns. It's going to impact their survivability. We've got to get moving as fast as we can to deal with the problem of global warming as, as just one of the key solutions that are out there because it's such a big problem and it's only going to get worse unless we act. I have two questions to close up with. This is a, it's, I, I can enthusiastically endorse the book. It's, it's, it's very good and I think it's useful. Thank you. I also think it's a snapshot of a place in time. Yes. And everyone here and everyone they might talk to is going to continue to get messages from industry, from you know, environmentalists, from people who know what they're talking about, from people who don't know what they're right. talking about. Are there any basic lines of critique that you can apply to a message when it comes in to try to get the, sure. the truth of it? Sure, you know, it, all, you always want to be careful of the, of the messenger. Um, there's something we often call greenwashing. If it's a company who is touting a very small improvement, say they're planting a few more trees, you should probably be, be pretty skeptical about the environmental claims they're making. Um, if they're focusing on, for example, greening their buildings but not their products, then maybe you should be a little more skeptical about the claims that the company is making. Uh, but at the end of the day, part of the reason why we did this book is to keep people focused on the issues that matter. Don't spend a lot of time focusing on or listening to a lot of the greenwashing, a lot of the advertising. Look at the data. What's the fuel economy of the car? What's the efficiency of the refrigerator? How is the food made? Is it, is it fruit, grains, fish, vegetables? or is it focused on uh, beef? If it's focused on beef, then try to cut back on it. You've got to just keep going back to the top things that matter if you want to cut through that noise, because it's easy to get paralyzed, I think, by all the different messages that are out there. And hey, 
by the book. You can always open it up and if someone's making a claim in a lot of cases, for example, in the back of the book, we've got data that talks about the typical emissions for, the diff for about 500 different activities that we all engage in. So you can see for yourself what matters most. If someone's worried about paper versus plastic and they've got this great new high efficiency plastic bag that they want you to buy, look in the book, you'll see that it's tiny in comparison to the car you drive. Don't worry about it. Get a hybrid instead. How can we work, and I know this is not going to happen overnight, how can we work to depoliticize global warming and the arguments about carbon footprint? And I'm glad you brought that up because when it comes to global warming, the science is clear. Uh, we are putting a lot more carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere that are trapping heat and warming up the planet as we drive our cars, as we burn coal in our power plants. This isn't a political issue. The, the science is clear. There's a broad scientific consensus that it's happening. We're causing a lot of it, uh, and we need to do something about it. But yes, inevitably what you're trying to do, though, is you're trying to change the status quo. And so there are going to be people out there who work very hard to protect the status quo. That's why we're talking to you. That's why we wrote this book. Because one of the best ways to cut through all the politics is just to start doing it. If you take these steps, then it's hard for a politician to say, oh, that's impossible, that's hard, it's going to cost too much money, the technology doesn't exist. You can say, well, pardon me, I did it. I can tell you the story of my refrigerator and how much more efficient it is. I can tell you the story about how I have a lower risk of heart attack and lower emissions from eating less meat. So prove them wrong. That's one of the best ways, I think, to cut through all the political noise. And politicians will use those examples. People who are going to support you will talk about you on the stump. You know, walk up to that politician, tell them your story, and who knows, maybe a few weeks down the line they'll, they'll integrate you into their speech. Better be a good story because they're looking for home runs, but still, you know, you've got to start somewhere. Share your stories, share them with your community, with your local leaders, and we'll get there. California, I think, is proof positive that we can. And that is that. Thank you so much. We really you. appreciate it. Thank you for the excellent questions. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thanks.